So, so maybe today, I mean the task today, maybe it's like just a revision for some of you, but also it's important for other people who, uh, I mean, didn't start, I mean, uh, who do not have background in, uh, in, in machine learning. So, so, uh, so, so I mean, this artificial neuron, it's the basic unit in artificial neural network, and it's very important because uh, this is the basic unit. So if we need to build the feed forward the neural network, in fact, it's just a bunch of those uh, neurons or perceptron. We call it a perceptron, or we can just call it a, a, a neuron. And if you need to build very, very complex and very complex structure, we need to understand how a perceptron works. So a perceptron is very, very important. You can imagine that a perceptron, it's a simple unit for classifications, for regression, and you can use it for even solving uh, very complex problems, not very complex, but some, I mean, and complex problems. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I will talk today about a perceptron and uh, the perceptron, uh, there is optimizer for uh, an algorithm which is used for training the perceptron. We call it perceptron learning rule. Uh, I want also to talk about something called adaptive linear uh, unit or neuron. Uh, a perceptron, we can use a perceptron for classification and we can use it also for regression. If you want to use it according to the activation function, so if you want to use it for classification, we need to select specific um, a specific um, um, activation function. If you want to use it for regression, we need to use a different a different uh, activation function. And in this case, also we cannot use perceptron learning rule. We need to use a gradient descent. And in this case, we will study I mean a different different version from a perceptron, which is called adaptive linear uh, neuron. And we will take some examples. Um, so I want to start with a perceptron. So the perceptron, it's a basic unit of artificial neuron. It's this circle. And it can classify a task into two classes, for example, positive, negative, 0, 1, whatever, yes and no, for example. So if you have binary classification problem, last time we studied different types of uh, uh, classification problems. So uh, there is binary classification and the multi-class classification. Multi-class classification, it means we have several classes. Like iris data set. In iris data set, we have three classes, correct? So it's a multi class classification. But uh, other problems, it could be binary. So we just need to decide yes and no, for example. For example, cats and dogs, it's binary classification. We have picture and we need to decide if this picture for a dog, for a dog or for a cat. So it's a binary classification problem. <clears throat> so not, we just need to make decision yes and no, for example. Black, white. So we call it binary classification problem. So a perceptron, it works only for binary classification problems. But also, last time we said that if you have multi-class classification, we can use, we can still use a perceptron. We can use a perceptron, but in this case, we will use a technique called one versus rest. So, so we need to build the one model for each class. So for example, in Iris, <clears throat> if we have three classes, I need to have three models, one for each class, because each, each, each model can just say yes and no. So uh, for each class, we need one model to just say yes and no, using this technique, which is called the one versus rest. So it will just classify one class against the rest, and so on. So also we can use binary, uh, we can use a perceptron for solving the multi-class uh, classification problems. We will take some examples later on. So the decision function can be defined by line. In fact, it's combination of weighted, uh, I mean, it's input values multiplied by weights, and, and the bias value. So the decision boundary here, in fact, it's it's this one. So if I want to um, just to annotate, for example, so 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 if we if we uh, um, yes, so this line, do you see this one? It's omega one x one plus omega two x two plus b, for example. Those weights, those omega one, omega two, omega n, for example, those are the weights. And those weights reflect importance of each input for this problem. And we have something called bias. So the decision boundary will be defined by this line. It's linear equation, omega x plus b, like in regression. So we try to create decision boundary and this decision boundary will be, will be a line. This line consists of omega x plus b. You can just say that omega, it is a slope of the line, right? This is a slope. And, and this bias, the y-intercept, it's the intersection with the y-axis. So if you have omega, for any, you will just imagine you have an equation y equal omega x plus b, select any omega value, for example, omega equal one, 
B equals zero, so it will be linear, which will go through the origin with with slope uh, 45 degrees. So so this line this line can be parameterized by omega and B. Omega it is the slope of the line, and B it's the intersection with y axis. So this intersection and omega it is the slope. So when we change the omega, we will change the slope of the line, and then when we change the bias, we can shift the line up and, and down. Correct? We can go up and down on our search space. So you have this line, you can have another line up, you can go down, you can change the slope, for example, so you can get different types of lines. And this is very important because those are the tools which will help, help us to control the decision boundary so we can classify our problem. So you have two data sets and I want to classify it. So just imagine I have this data set, for example. So this data set, for example. And I want to class, I want to find a decision boundary. So it's, it's a logic that the decision boundary will, will look like this one. So it will be like this one. So I need to generate this line, right? This blue one. This line will help us to classify this problem correctly. How can we get this line? So this line will be defined by omega and B. Omega, it's the weights, uh, weights of uh, this perceptron, for example, or the slope. And the B, it's the intersection with the y-axis. So, so in this model, we have X. X, it's the number of features, the number of inputs. So for example, in Iris data set, we have four inputs. Do you remember? Beta lens, width, and the simple lens and width. So we have four inputs. So X, those are the feature or inputs. Those weights, we need to uh, attach one weight for each input, and this weight, it will reflect its importance. So for example, if this weight equals zero value, for example, it means this, in, this input or this feature is not important for my problem, right? When it's positive, when it's negative, we can just say it's positive correlated and negatively correlated with a decision boundary. Is it important? You have, you have a problem, for example, and I need to classify, and I have lots of inputs, Maybe some of those inputs are important, some of those in inputs are not important. So this weight value, it will reflect the importance of this feature for my problem. And at the end, we will calculate this net value. So this net value or this output, it will be weighted sum. So in fact, we can just say that net value, it's, it's like summation of omega x plus p. Once we calculated this value, we need to classify my problem. So uh, we will set this one equal to zero. When you set this one equal to zero, it means all points which are located on the straight line, on the line here. If this value is greater than zero, it means the points are located above the line. If this value less than zero, it means those points locate uh, uh, underneath the line. So, so the decision boundary, in fact, it will be like omega x plus p equals zero. So all points which are located on the line, it would be just zero, right? And all points which above it, it would be classified into positive one because this net value would be greater than or equal zero for all points which are located above it, and it would be negative otherwise. So in this case, if we have two uh, two data sets, and those uh, so those two data sets are linearly separable, linearly separable means we can create a line, and this line will divide them into two different classes. Uh, we can use this simple model for for classifying it. We will see an example. So, so the weights cause rotation of the decision line or boundary. It's a rotation because it's it's a slope. So if you, if you select slope equal one, the line will be like this one. If you select slope equal negative one, the line will be like this one, right? So when we change omega value, you will change, you will rotate the line in the, in the uh, search space. You will rotate it, right? And when you change the bias, you will translate the line up and down. You can take the line up and down. So in this case, I can control the line because when you have a data set, it's a static data set, right? You have a data set and I need to find a line which will classify it. So I need to have tools. Those tools will be the bias value and the omega value. You can change it by yourself, step by step, until you have a line which you are happy with, right? Uh, and in fact, in, in a perceptron and in, in, in neural network in general, we start by initializing those numbers by negative by some random values and after that we will change it step by step until we are happy with with the performance how can we measure that we are happy we need for example to uh, calculate uh, we need to uh, to classify all data points correctly so we need to minimize classification error for example right so so i want all data points to be correctly classified 
So I will still, uh, I will keep adjusting omega and B until all data points are correctly classified. And when it's correctly classified, it means my accuracy will be 100%, for example, 99%, 95%. So we will keep changing omega and B until we have a line which will classify all classes correctly or as much as possible. How can we change it using the perceptron learning rule? We will not do it by ourselves because it will be time consuming, right? So we will just uh, find an algorithm and this algorithm will do it for us. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I, need to, I need to close this one each time. Okay, so uh, I mean this perceptron, it has a graphical model and it's inspired by this biological neuron. You can just compare. I, I need to remove uh, those uh, annotated stuff. So, yes, so this is the graphical model and this is a perceptron as, as we mentioned last time. I mean, the decision boundary, it's easy. So we will we will just say it's net, for example, it's, it's net equal omega x plus b. So this is my decision boundary. Omega x, so each input here is multiplied by an omega value. So x1 multiplied by omega 1, x n multiplied by omega n. We have the submission here. So in fact, I can write it like this one. Is this one, it's in vector vector notation, but if you want to do it one by one, you can just write it like this one. Omega i x i plus p, i equal one to n. So this is my decision boundary, and we will set this one equal to zero. So when we do it, we will we will create this this line, right? When you change omega and and b, I mean b, it's the intersection with the y-axis, right? And then when you change omega, you will change you will rotate the decision line in in my in my search space, and this is the model. So we will get the submission here, and after that we will uh, I mean, we will get a number here, right? This number it could be equal zero. When it's zero, it means the data points are located on the line, right? When it's greater than or equal to zero, it means the data point located here. When it's less zero, for example, it means we are underneath the line. So I will get a number here. So after creating this line, after we create this decision line, I will have some input. I will substitute those input values into this equation, right? So after training your model, uh, those omega will take some values, B will be some value, and when you have a new example and I want to classify it, I will just, I will use this equation. I will multiply omega by X, right? Plus B, and I will see this number. How is that? What is the value of this number? If the value equals zero, it means that the data points are located, located on the decision line. If it is greater than or equal zero, it means it's located here in this area. If it is less than zero, it means the data point is here underneath the line. So now I, now, now the output from here, it will be just number, and this number it could be positive number, negative number, or zero number. So those numbers, I want to convert those numbers into decision because in classification problem, in binary classification problem, I just need yes and no, right? So we need to just get yes and no. So maybe yes will be maybe plus one. Plus one means yes. It belongs to this class. Maybe negative one, it would be just no, means no. So now I need to convert those numbers into decision, into decision plus, one negative one. So in this case, we will use this activation function. We call it hard lamp activation function or a step activation function. And this one, it's simple. It's it's like this one. So um, so it's it's a uh, this is my function, right? So this one, it's net. Right, so this net value or the submission value, uh, we will put it here and then we will get some value. If this value is greater than or equal zero, the output will be all time plus one, otherwise it would be negative one. So now we are converting all numbers into just plus one and negative one. Plus one and negative one, it's the decision, right? So is it, does this picture, for example, belongs to this class or not? If it belongs to it, it would be plus one, otherwise it would be negative one. So we have just a clear decisions, crisp, just yes and no, black and white. So the perceptron is very simple and it's inspired by this biological neuron here and, and, and the mathematical model. 
this is a model net equal omega x plus b. We will train the model. How we will train the model? We need to adjust omega and b until we have good performance. So the idea now is to how to measure the performance, right? It could be accuracy, for example. It could be prediction error, which we need to minimize. So we need to we need each we need each example to be correctly classified. If it's not correctly classified, it means we have a, a, a prediction error by one, for example. So we need to increase the performance. Um, We have a problem here in uh, each, each time I need to maybe clear all the problem. Mm -hmm. So so uh, so finally the decision, I mean the output will be like this one, y equal one when when the data point is located above the line, and y equal minus one when the data point is located below it. Right? We need to uh, work with an example, but we can uh, talk first about a perceptron learning rule. How can we adjust those weights? Now, what, now we know the model. How the model look like? We have weights, we have inputs, we have bias value here. This one, it's a bias value. We call it bias value. I mean, some people they draw it like this one here. We have here plus one, and we have this bias value. So now, how can we how can we initialize our model? How can I train my model? So, so your model is simple. I mean, it's one line. So if you want to make a code for it, for example, it's just simple. We can just say it's net equal omega x plus b vector multiplications. And after that, if net uh, greater than or equal zero, that may mean output will be plus one. Otherwise, the output will be minus one. So the model is very, very simple. But how can I'm we start? Sorry. Hmm? Uh, the model is considered as Linear just the step function is the only non linear in this model. The uh, whole perception um, model that uh, we see here uh, it's no, a you can, linear in, system. Yeah, in fact, you can use a step function, you can use sigmoid function, right? So it's up to you to select or up to you. Uh, this, is, uh, this is also non linear, uh, the sigmoid function, isn't it? Yes, yes, and we are here, we, we have step function here, but if you want to use, uh, because a step function here will give you clear position, yes, and the no, for example, right? But maybe someone else is interested in probability, right? So I want to know the probability that this example belongs to this class. So in this case, I cannot use a step function because the step function, it will just give you clear decision means and the no. So in this case, I need to, uh, to replace step function with maybe sigmoid, because the sigmoid, the output in the sigmoid will be number between zero and one. So in this case, I will have the probability that this example belongs to this class. So for example, in Iris data set, uh, I need to check the probability that, uh, or uh, dogs and the cats, for example, uh, if, if you have an image of a dog, for example, so it will give you plus one. If you use the crisp, if you use the step function, if it is cat, so it will be minus one, right? Uh, so maybe someone else who want to, he is interested in the probability, so he will use uh, a sigmoid function. And in this case, for example, some dogs and the cats are very similar in size. So maybe you have a small dog, which looks like a cat. So maybe the probability will be 0.6. So I'm interested okay. in the probability because he looks like so in this case, we need to use different activation function, and in this case, we can use uh, sigmoid. Let's say. Yes. Yeah, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's say we have a, a system, and I want it to be uh, linear. So can I uh, use uh, a straight line for regression? Yes. Just like regression for classification, or it's just for regression? No, I mean, when it's a straight line, will you, because in the straight line, because in the regression problems, I'm interested in the whole range. Ah, uh, yes. I, I am interested because, for example, if you are predicting, um, so predicting, not classifying, if you yeah. are predicting annual income, so maybe the annual income, it would be number between zero and 10 million. Yeah. So I need to keep all those numbers. So in this case, I need to use linear function. I cannot use uh, oh, sigmoid yeah. and I cannot use uh, step function. Mm -hmm. Step function okay. and sigmoid, we use it when we classify them. And linear function, we, we need to use it when we are um, um, I mean, predicting. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Johan, do you have any questions? Yeah, I was just thinking, because uh, now you say 
like this net that we have, that's always linear, but then you can have different uh, types of activation functions, as you say, for classification or for mm -hmm. regression, but the, the net itself will always be this linear yes. omega x plus b. Yes, this is correct. Because okay. like yeah. the combination here, it's omega x. Yeah. Squares <clears throat> so it's and then it's just uh, what type of activation function you want, to, what you want to get out of the net. Yes, uh, but also, in fact, we can we can have we have a trick here. So, for example, instead of providing x one to the model, if you provide an x square, right? And this one it's x m square. So what will happen? So in this case, maybe we uh, I, I mentioned this example last time. Maybe so we will generate the decision boundary will be a circle, right? Uh, if if omega one equal omega two omega m m for example. So in this case, it will be just a pure circle and symmetric. But if omega one and omega two are different, maybe it will be oval, right? So in fact, we can play with it, but uh, b b b b uh, through uh, the features data. So feature feature construction. So I need to create new features, for example, to make the problem much easier for for the model. So if your data is non-linearly separable, inseparable. So in this case, maybe we can play with the feature, but the model itself it's linear because those combinations omega x. I mean, it's it's linear, but but also in other models we have this combination all time. But maybe if you um, select a different activation function or try to play with uh, with the features, right? So in this case we can try to generate more complex decision boundaries. So how do you know what what type of uh, decision boundary model to use or net, uh, or so to say? Yes. Uh, for example, we had an example called circle uh, data circles data set. We will have this example at some point in the future. So it's a data yeah. set like this one. So I have some data points in the middle, right? And uh, and um, uh, and I have some data points uh, uh, in the outside here, right? So and it's in two-dimensional space. So I have two features here. I have x1 and x2. So how can we classify this problem? Can we classify this problem by a perception? Yes, but then you would you. No, it's linearly inseparable. So we have to uh, put them into higher dimensions. Yes, yes, this is correct. Uh, so we need to use. The... Maybe someone has the music. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, so in this case, in fact, we need to uh, we need to use higher dimensional features. So instead of working with x1, so in here I can build a perceptron. And this perceptron will have x1 and x2 as inputs. So if you use the x1 and the x2, for example, and I'm, I'm just use a split function here or whatever, right? So in this case, I, I mean this model as it is, it will generate one straight line. So the line will be like this one. So maybe in this case, we will not achieve 100% accuracy. So in this case, we need to play with the features. So we can use higher order features, for example, higher order features, which means if we can use x1 square and x2 square instead of x1 and x2, in this case, the decision boundary will be a circle, so we can generate a circle. But so you're saying that this is no longer a perceptron, then it's something else. No, it's a still it's a still a perceptron. It's a still right. a perceptron, but we just uh, because uh, I mean uh, we call it feature construction. For example, we need to create new features which can help us to simplify the model. So if, uh, so for okay. example, in deep learning, people don't play with features; they just use raw data. And they leave the task for the machine learning model to extract features and to fix itself by, it, by itself by itself. So in this case, we, we, we just feed raw data to the model. But okay. in this specific problem, if you will use the raw data as it is x1 and x2, maybe it will be very complex for the model to achieve be, uh, good performance. And in this case, we need to play with the features, feature construction. We need to create higher order features and those higher order features Will help us to simplify. I mean, the problem for the model. So we will we will still use the same model, but instead of playing with x1 and x2, we will we will work with x1 square and x2 square. Maybe someone else will just say, okay, x1 interaction between features. So it could be x1 times x2, x1 times x2 square. So how you make it? So there are some techniques in in, in feature engineering to engineer new features, or maybe by domain expert. I mean, you know that the data set looks like a circle. So maybe if I use x1 square and x2 square, it will be we can generate a complex decision boundary which will we, we, we will classify the problem correctly. Uh, so this uh, 
contracting feature is not um, just part of the perception. It's, uh, no, no, it's not part from the perception. No, you have your data set. Uh, your data set is a table. You have X1, you have X2, for example. If you will work with X1 and X2 as it is, uh, maybe the accuracy would be 50% or something. So you can just say at some point, now I need to try to engineer my features. So what about X1 square? What about X2 square? What about X1 times X2? So X1 um, times X2, it means- So this part is a pre-processing part uh, before- data, Yes, this is correct, data pre-processing. Uh -huh. So uh, data pre-processing, scaling, is, uh, I mean standardization, normalization, for example. Maybe also feature engineering. We need to engineer our features, right? I, have, uh, I actually have a question about the standardization that uh, you just uh, the last session. Mm -hmm. Um, in acceleration, uh, if we have a uh, um, just a very uh, high, the, uh, with a high uh, value, with a very uh, a feature or uh, just a sample with a very uh, high value in our uh, data. Out layer. So you mean you, you have an outlayer, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so how to deal with the outliers? Uh, when we standardize uh, the outlier, uh, is uh, kind of uh, uh, narrowing down the whole data set because there are some outliers. So uh, why we don't, uh, is, instead of mean, we use um, a median of the uh, data set in order to uh, get rid of these outliers. If, if we use the median, it will be possible to... Uh... Um, when we are uh, standardizing or normalizing the uh, data set, uh, we are, um, uh, uh, there, uh, we, uh, we, we subtract each value mean. from I'm minimum sorry. and the divide yeah. by range. Yeah, yeah. And so the range is uh, defin uh, defined by the highest value and the lowest value, which mm -hmm. be the outliers. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, um, uh, if our important uh, samples um, uh, maybe could be very uh, um, low, uh, could uh, low have low values. Mm -hmm. so, um, could we deal with these outliers uh, in pre-processing part? Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, last time I mentioned that it's very, very important to block your data and they try to visualize it because when um, you block your data, you try to discover if I have lots of outliers. For example, maybe those outliers that could be one class by itself. So. Um, because um, you need to you need to visualize you need to block your data for example in 2D and they try to see um, I mean is there any outliers because outliers it's a problem and in statistics it's a problem also because it's maybe it's uh, some problem in a sensor or some data maybe you can just remove those data points data uh, examples which are outlier because uh, because it will damage the rest for example it will have huge impact on uh, on other data points so maybe you need to visualize your data first. And after that, if you have an outlier, maybe you can create um, maybe a different, different cluster or a class for those outliers, for example, and try to deal with it in a different way, for example. So, um, but, but it's a problem. Maybe we need to find also search for other, I mean, different approaches for um, I mean, normalizing our data sets. But normalization is important. You can go with, without it, but, but it's risky. When you go without it, it's risky. Uh, so it's important to be sure that at least not between zero and one or minus one and one, at least all, all my features are within the same range, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't know why, uh, which time I need to... So, uh, so I mean the perceptron learning rule, uh, as, as I told you, when you start building your model, you, I mean, you have your data as a table, for example, you have, for example, a table and it has X1 and X2, this is my data sets. So now I have my data sets. So based on my data sets, I will design or I will decide how my model will look like. So my model will have two inputs, for example, and according to my problem, it's regression, it's a classification, I will decide what activation function I will use it here. And so I have here omega one and omega two, 
and I have a bias value here called B, for example, I have here submission, and this is my activation function, for example. So now, if you want to start training your model, we need to initialize those weights with some value. Because if I want to, uh, because uh, when we start playing with those data, I have my data point like this one here, and I will start with some random line, right? I need to start from a random line. So we need to initialize omega one, omega two, and B with some random values. And in this case, you will plot any decision line. So maybe the decision line will look like something like this one. This one will be the initial, the first decision line. And for this decision line, you will calculate error, right? And, and you will use this error for adjusting those weights in a way to minimize this uh, prediction error, for example. So how can we do this? Uh, so, um, so I will initialize omega, and I will initialize, the, uh, I will need here something called bias, for example. So I will initialize omega and b by some random values. I will apply my inputs. And when you apply your inputs, you will create a line. If those weights are random, you will you will create random line, right? Random decision boundary. Uh, we will calculate the error, and the error will be the difference between uh, the target value and the output value, right? So we calculate y. We have the target value. I mean. Uh, my data set, it's, it's x1, for example, and it's x2, and it's t. x1 and x2, we call it input features, and the t, we call it target feature. So this is the output or class or label. So those labels are, are some plus one, plus one, negative one, negative one, for example. And I have some example here. I will apply this example to my model here, and we will get the output. So maybe the output is plus one or negative one, but I don't know, is it is it correctly classified or, or misclassified? So I will subtract it from target. So it will be target minus y. So this one will be the error. And I will use this error function to adjust the weights uh, example by example. How can we do this? Using this, uh, this those equation. Those equation, we call it perceptron learning rule. I need to adjust weights, right? So to adjust weights, we will use this equation omega equal omega plus delta omega. Because each, each iteration, I will adjust, I will change Omega value by very small value. This small value will equal learning rate multiplied by error multiplied by input. So to adjust weights, to adjust those weights, uh, uh, so this one each time we will adjust those weights by a value called the delta omega. And is this delta omega equal the learning rate multiplied by error multiplied by input? Right? So, so we will do it example by example. So for example, if the error is negative, what does it mean error is negative? It means, for example, if t equal, if t equal minus one, so this, this is class minus one, and if y equal plus one, for example, right? So in this case, the error will be minus one, minus one, so it will be minus two, which means um, it has relationship with the decision boundary. So I need to move the decision boundary to, uh, to I mean, to, uh, so so I, I I want to draw it for example. So I have I have some data point like imagine that we have this decision boundary for example, and I have a data point which is uh, which is here, but it should be both this one. For example, I have the data point here, and I have another data point here. Uh, I want to make it with different color. Uh, so I have here another data point. The blue one, it's it's plus one. The red one, it's negative one. For example, right? Uh, so imagine that uh, the the decision, this plus one, it's uh, it's it's wrongly classified, right? Or or the red one, it's it's wrong. So imagine that this is my decision line here. So this one, it's plus one. This is correct, but this one, it's not correct. So this one should be negative one, but now it's classified as plus one, right? So in this case. I will, uh, we will uh, calculate the error. So the error will be the target, which is minus one because it's it's minus one, but it's misclassified as plus one. So the error will be minus two. We will use this error uh, to, um, to to minimize um, because when this when this error is negative, <clears throat> when this error is negative, it means I want to I want to uh, decrease the value of omega. So I need to I need to rotate the line because when we change omega we will rotate the line. So now I need to minimize omega by some small value. This value will be the learning rate multiplied by error multiplied by the input, right? So in this case, 
we will we will change the line because I need to uh, I need to decrease the slope of the line. So maybe the slope of the line it will it will make like this one. So we will try to move the line in a way to correctly classify each example, and we will do this one example by example. So the perceptron learning rule it's uh, very simple. We need to calculate compute the output each time for each new example. We need to calculate the output. Uh, so for each uh, for each um, <clears throat> for each input, we will calculate the error. We will calculate first the output. How can we calculate the output by applying the equation omega x plus p? So simple net equal omega x plus p. So you initialize first you initialize weights. I initialize the weights and the bias by some values. I will substitute each x here and I will calculate the output. When you have net, you will apply this net to the activation function. So your output will be plus one or negative one. And after that, you will calculate the error, which is the difference between T and Y. Uh, this error value, we will multiply it by the learning rate, which is a step size. For example, it could be big number or small number. It's up to, uh, to you to select, for example, multiply by the input. So we will calculate this delta omega. Once you have delta omega, you can adjust your omega. So omega, old or new omega equal old omega plus this delta omega. So now we, we started to change omega value step by step. Right, we will do the same for the bias because also we have this bias. We will do it for omega first, and after that we will do it for the bias. But the bias, if we can go to the model here, um, uh, I don't know why uh, I cannot move. Uh, Yes, uh, yes. So, so do, do you see here? I mean, uh, I mean, when we calculate, so we have inputs multiplied by omega, and we have uh, one multiplied by this bias. I mean, the bias has an input equal one on time. So, so when we need to adjust the bias, it will not be multiplied by it will be multiplied by one. So, just imagine that it's multiplied by one, not by x, but it will be multiplied. So, it will be the same, but instead of multiplying this delta omega by uh, uh, learning rate multiplied by error multiplied by the input, it will be the learning rate multiplied by the error. And then we will use it for adjusting the bias. We will take an example and we will. Um, uh, it's interesting because I cannot move the my slides. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, before going to an example, what kind of activation functions which we can use? You can use step function, and if you will use a step function, for example, uh, like this one, it's uh, I mean the output would be plus one and zero, for example. So it's according to your problem, according to how how your data set look like. So if you have two classes, I mean we are talking about binary classification problems. So maybe those binary classification problems, I will give a, a cat maybe a label plus one and dog will be zero. So in this case, I will use this activation function. Maybe someone else will say, no, one class will be plus one and one class will be negative one. So in this case, I need I need to use sign function. They call it a symmetric step function or a symmetric hard limb function. If you are interested in, uh, in, in probability, so we will use sigmoid function. Because in case of sigmoid function, the output would be numbered between zero and plus one. So the output here will be a number between zero and plus one. So it will be probability. So maybe the output here is, is 0.6. So it means as uh, a probability that this example belongs to this class is 60%. Uh, and after that, you can you can put a threshold. So you can just say all probabilities greater than 0.5, it will be classified into class one, for example. And the otherwise, it will be class uh, minus one or class zero. Yes, uh, What's the difference? 
Uh, what's the difference between uh, a step function and some sign function in the performance? Because no, no, there is no difference at all. It's according to your data set. So, for example, imagine Iris data set. We will use, we will play use Iris data set. In Iris data set, we have three classes. Uh, if, if we need to use, if we need to convert it into binary classification, so we will select the first two classes. So maybe you can just say, okay, the first class will be plus one. The second one will be minus one. In this case, I need to use this sigmoid function, sine function. Someone else will say, no, uh, um, I mean, um, class one, I will represent it by plus one, and the class two will be represented by zero. So in this case, he will use a step function. So there is no difference at all, in fact. But I mean, the difference here, if you will use sigmoid function, because in sigmoid function, we need to understand the meaning of the output. The output will be probability, because each time, the output will be a number between zero and the plus one. So this one will be probability. It could be 0.2, which means the probability that this example belongs to this class is 20%, which means it's the other one, not this one. So, um, I, I still have uh, some problem. In, So uh, it's, it's just an example, uh, we have the code, so we will go to the code uh, soon in, in GitHub. You have the link here in the slides and the, the slides are in Blackboard. So um, so I want to implement I want to implement a perceptron. I mean, perceptron, we have it in fact in, in, in Python, but if you want to implement it by yourself. So you just need to define, I mean, you need to define, for example, number of epochs. Number of epochs, it's number of iterations which will be used for training my model, right? Uh, learning rate, we need to define the learning rate. So this is a step size. It's, it's eta, this one, you need to define it. So someone, you will define it by 0 0.2, maybe another one, you say 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Anyway, it's number between zero and one. And the, the weights and the and the, the weights, we need, to, we need to initialize it. How can we initialize the weights? Here, I initialized it to zeros, in fact. So I started by just zeros. All numbers are zeros. So, so we can just say that the line, the first decision line, it will be x-axis, right? Because all all uh, numbers by zeros, and uh, I need to uh, collect uh, training error. I mean, this is the perceptron. Uh, so, uh, so the perceptron. I mean, this is the perceptron. Uh, so, in, in fact, it's inputs multiplied by weights plus bias. So, this equation here, in fact, it's it's net equal omega x plus b. Can you see it? So it's a dot product between inputs, which is x, and weights. And and not all weights, it's the weights from omega 1 to, because I, I, I assumed here that I have omega 0. Omega 0 will be the bias. So the model here, if I have two inputs, the model here would be like this one. So this one would be, for example, it's omega, I call it omega 1. This one, it's omega 2. This one, x1 and x2. And the bias here, I will call it omega zero, for example. So the model will be like this one. So the equation is very simple. So it's omega x. I mean, this is the decision boundary or the decision. We will use it for prediction. So uh, this net value, if this net value equals zero, it means we, the point located on the uh, line. If it is positive, if it's a point located above the line. Negative means it at the point located below the line. So we will calculate this net value. So this net value would be omega x plus b. And after that, you know, this is the activation function. What activation function you want to use? So here it's 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 as output would be one or negative one. So it's a sine function, right? Do you see it this, that part? So if net greater than or equal zero, the output will be one. Otherwise, it would be minus one. So in fact, here if I want to draw it. It will be like this one. So this is my model here. So it's it's a very simple. I mean, perceptron. It's a very simple. So net equal omega x plus omega zero or omega x plus b, and this is my activation function. If net greater than or equal zero, the output will be plus one. Otherwise, the output will be negative one. So this is my my model. To train your model, we need to use perceptron learning rule. So this one for prediction, I will use this one for prediction. So after training your model, if you want to predict, for example, you can just say, I mean, for x equal 
one and then o by five, for example, I want to see what is the output. So we use this one for prediction. We need to write another function for training because I need to train my model. So in training, we will train it for a uh, number of epochs. So for number of epochs, I will train my model for maybe can just select number of epochs equal 10. So I will repeat this process 10 times. And in each epoch, in fact, we use the whole data set in one punch, like one block. So in each epoch, we use the whole data points for training my model. And we will repeat this process several times until the performance is okay. So here you need, you, you define number of epochs. And in each epoch, in fact, we apply the whole data points in each epoch. So for example, if your data set consists of 20 data points and you selected number of epochs by 10, so in this case, I will, I will apply those 20 data points 10 times to my model, right? So, uh, so I, I first, first, we initialized here. Do you see here, we initialized the weights by the two zeros values. First, I need to calculate prediction. So prediction equal predict for inputs. So I will apply inputs, each input, and I will calculate predictions. And after that, I will adjust the weights. How can we adjust the weights? So do you see here, this one, weights plus equal. It means weights equal weights plus. Plus learning rate multiplied by the error, which is labeled minus prediction multiplied by inputs for, for the weights. And for the bias, it will be copy and based but it will be multiplied here by one. So this is exactly the equations which we described in the first slide. So, and, and the error, I need to calculate the error. What was the prediction error each time? So the error, of course, it equal labels minus prediction. And I will just need to keep those numbers with me for plotting, for example. So for each, uh, for each example. So I will do it example by example. And for each example, for the first example, I will calculate the error. What was the error here? For the second example, what was the error? And I will add it to the same value. And at the end, I will keep the mean value uh, from it for each epoch. So I can have a plot at the end. I mean, the plot will be like this one. So here we have number of epochs. We have here the error. So at, at epoch number one, what was the error value or the mean error value? It will be maybe this number. In the second epoch, I should expect that it will go down because we are training. So maybe it will be smaller, a little bit. It will be like this one, for example. So at the end, I will have this graph, which means that we are making a progress in, in training. When error decreases, it means my model started to train my data points. So in each epoch here, we will apply the whole data point, the, the whole data sets in each epoch. And the error here would be the mean error in each epoch, the mean error for, for, for my data set, for my batch, my data, data batch or batch size, my data, my data, my data set size, for example, uh, we will repeat this process until we, we reach this point. If you want, uh, I mean, last time we, we talked about uh, training, we can divide data points into training and the testing and the validation. You can do it here as well, if you want. So if you want to do it, but here in this example, because this is the first example, I just use the whole data point for training. Uh, for each epoch, uh, we, uh use the whole data set for we use what uh, in each epoch mm -hmm. you use uh, the whole data set here in this example because I, I, I this is our first example so i didn't divide the data into training testing i just uh, yeah i know i know before. but uh, the whole training data set uh, yes. use the whole training data set in each epoch yes here here in this example Okay, uh, and uh, what about the overfitting? Because yes, this is correct, but in general, this is not correct. But because this is the first example, so I just used uh -huh. all my data points for uh -huh. training, right? But in fact, we need to divide it one part for training, one part for testing, and also maybe yes. one part for validation, right? So if you if you want to validate your model here, do you, do you see? So for example, this one we will use it for training. This one will be for testing, and one part from the training set will be used for validation. So in this case, in each epoch, I will use this part for training, right? And uh, the one for validation, I will just use use it for just uh, predicting. I will uh, just different color. So do you see that part here? Validation part. So I will I will do the same. I will I will use this part for training, as we are doing here. But and each each time here, you can you need to add something here. You, you will use here this validation part for testing your model. So 
I will add here some part prediction. So after this for loop here, I need to write another for loop. And instead of using inputs from this training input, I will change this one into validation input, for example. And oh. in validation, we don't train. So you will just calculate prediction and calculate prediction error, and you will not you will not adjust to it in validation part. And in this case, you will have two values. You will have two error values. Error coming for, from training and another error coming from validation. So this one, it's the one which is coming from training. So maybe we will get another one here, which is coming from maybe validation, right? So this validation will be like this one. And at some point, maybe the model will overfit, so it will go up. So you will discover that you are overfitting. You cannot discover that you overfit your data from, uh, from training. You need to get validation set. You need to have a validation set for testing, for testing overfitting. Uh, so what's uh, there is no uh, information in uh, because when uh, the the system or uh, the neural network uh, sees the whole data set, uh, so the and we fed the data again, there's no more information. Uh, so why the system uh, MSE is getting uh, lower? after uh, next epochs. Uh, I don't know if I... Uh, yes. uh, this training, look, this training error, it will go down anyway. This training error? Yeah, 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 uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, this, is, this is logic because uh, uh, when, we, yeah, when we train the model more, uh, the model uh -huh. the performance will be better in the training data set and the model... This even with, the, will even with the same data, even with the same data, no, it's for the training, for because we use yeah, 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 the yeah. bot for training. For, the, for training, for training, each but, epoch, we yeah. fed the same data to the system, to the neural because, because I'm training, because if you are studying for an exam, for example, I should not give you, I should not cut pages and they shuffle it, right? If you are studying for exam, uh, uh, you, you can read the book uh, three, four, five times before the uh -huh. exam, correct? I get it. So it's the same book, the same material, but you repeat it, you're studying it every day, for example. So maybe you can read the whole course one time each week. So uh, at the end of the semester, for example, uh, you maybe you read it 10 times. So it's 10 box, right? But uh, if I need to really validate your knowledge, because if I will, at the end, if I will examine you in the material which you, you have been reading, maybe you will overfit. You will look fantastic, but maybe this is not the true. So I need to validate your behavior. So maybe I can make a small exam for you each day and it's uh, just to test, test, I mean, try to solve those problems. Try to solve those problems every day so I can measure your performance. Maybe at the beginning, the form of performance will be very bad. This is expected, but the performance will improve, will improve. And at some point, uh, at some point, maybe you will just, uh, I mean, our mindset will be, we will memorize the problems which we are wow. studying and we cannot generalize for other problems. So I just say, please, no, I memorize this one, please. I need I need the exam question from this one because I memorized those examples, but you cannot generalize. So if we change it something little bit, it will be hard for people to solve. You remember in our educations, we have some colleagues like this. When we were in early days in schools, some people they just are very good for memorizing things. He just memorized he cut all things by numbers. But but in the exam, if he, if they change a number, for example, he will not be able to manage right because he didn't understand the basic concept. But he just memorized mm -hmm. and he will just write down what he has memorized. So if you need to, if you need to discover that you are, uh, your model is overfitting, you need to book one part from your training data set for validation. And this part, we will not use it for training, just for prediction. So I will write this for loop again one more time. Mm -hmm. And it will be the same, exactly the same. But instead of using the training input, it will be validation input. And I will not adjust weights. We will just make predictions and calculate error. And this error, we need to call it prediction uh, validation error. And, uh, and instead of plotting only a training error, you will plot training error and the validation error. And from this validation error, you will discover if your model is overfitting or not. But without it, you will not discover it. So in this case, when you are training a model, when you are documenting your results, putting it in a paper, you must have this curve because we will need to see that this curve, this curve is very important because it will show if your model is overfitting or overfitting is very dangerous. Yes. Okay. Uh, so please, um, because I guess we, we should take a break. I don't want people to uh, get uh, tired.
So, uh, so this model, uh, it's it's in in, uh, in Dropbox. In fact, so I used this Iris data set. We have this Iris data set. Uh, so this Iris data set, as we described it last time, it has four columns. The features, we have four features, right? Do you see those four features? And those are the labels. This is the target features. In the target feature in this column, we have three classes. So those three classes, in fact, the data set, it's, it's 150 data points. So we have 50 data points, class one, 50 data points, class two, another 50 data points, class three. So I selected the first two because I need to convert this one into binary classification problem for a perception to solve it. So I just use the first block and the second block. So here I selected X from zero to 100 and Y from zero to 100. And I selected uh, column zero and the column uh, two. So I select those two columns as features. So we have two inputs because I want to plot the decision boundary in two dimensional space. So I selected only this one and I selected this one as inputs. And we selected two classes. So the model here, if you want to plot the model, it will be like this one. It has two inputs and we used this activation function, right? Uh, so you had a question before, which activation function should we use? Should we, we use a step function or sign function? Here I change it, iris setosa by one. And iris versi color by minus one. You see this one here? So my data, my, I mean, uh, why? It's those labels, iris virginica, setosa uh, and versi color. So I change it, I selected the first 100 data points. And in the first 100 data points, we have only two classes. Those two classes are iris setosa and iris versicolor. I replaced each iris setosa by plus one, and I replaced each iris versicolor by negative one. So now my data sets are ready for training. So X will be two values, two columns. This one, it's two columns. Those are the features. And for the labels, the labels will be just one, 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 plus one, plus one, plus one. So here, I mean, the output here would be plus one, plus one, plus one. Here it would be negative one, negative one, negative one. And in this case, we used uh, we used the sign activation function. So now I need to define a perceptron. You need to define a perceptron. So the perceptron has two inputs. This is a function which we used, we, we just built. So uh, we have two inputs. We will train the model for 10 epoch and we will select the learning rate equal 0.1. And we train the model. So this function, it's this function. Right? I ask okay. something in the meantime. Yes. Why do we go for these two input data? Yes. Why, why zero and two? It's a zero because uh, I just, uh, this is an example, we can select four, okay. right? Okay, fine. Yeah, but yeah. I just selected this one and this one and to see if we can classify, if we can manage to classify this problem using only those two. But if you want to select four, just select four. You have four inputs anyway. Mm -hmm. If you want to select four, I select two because I want to plot the decision boundary in two dimensional space. Okay. If it's a three, we need to plot it in three dimensional space. If it's a four, it would be impossible to plot it. So I just selected the first and the uh, first and the third, uh, and, and but you can change, right? Mm -hmm. Great. And after that, I will train my model. So this is the uh, training error. This is the training error. So we started by this value and those value increases and after that decreases and it becomes it becomes a zero here, right? So it takes maybe six epoch to train my model. Yes. Um, I want to just to finish this example so you can take a break. Is it okay to finish this example or should we take a break before finishing this one? So you can have maybe 15 minutes for working in the example. Um, so I want to plot the decision boundary. Do you remember the decision boundary, how it looked like? So it was like this one, net equal omega x plus p. We have here two inputs, so we have two omega values. So it was in fact omega one, x one, plus omega two, x two, plus b equal zero. When it's a zero, in fact, when we set this one equal zero, we are sure that we can generate this line because all data points which are located in the line are zeros. 
if you want to plot the line. So, uh, so I just, uh, this is, uh, I, I will plot my data point. I mean, from X1 to X1, this is one X1. This is the first feature. This one, it's the second feature. This is blue class, it's a versi color. And the red class, it's a status, right? And we generated this decision boundary by training our perceptron, right? We trained the perceptron and we got this line. So as I told you, this line, it's omega x, omega one, x one, plus omega two, x two, plus b. So we need to know what is omega one, what is omega two, what is b. You can print it, right? So uh, maybe I didn't print it here. So it, those weights, right? So those weights, it's, it's because my perceptron called the p, so it's b dot weights one, weights two, uh, which is this is a bias this one it is a bias right so in fact this one it's omega one this one it's omega two this one it's omega two if i want to plot this line how can we plot it do you see this equation we, i mean this equation i know omega one and i know omega two and i know the bias value right but i don't know x1 and x2 if you want to plot the line to to the, I mean, this decision boundary, just, just assume values for x1. So I assumed all values for x1 from here, from here to here, for example, from zero to maybe eight, right? So I just, I just find um, uh, x1 minimum and x, x1 maximum, right? So x1 minimum, x1 maximum. So I have all those points. And I generated a, a array of all values from uh, from this value to this value using this small step. So now I have a vector of x1 values, right? So I have all those points. Now I need to generate those points here in x2. How can I get it from this equation? So if you look into this equation, so I will write it in another way. So omega 2 x2 equal bias minus b, sorry, sorry. So it will be like omega two x two equal minus omega one x one minus b. Is it correct? So this equation omega one x one plus omega two x two plus b equals zero. This is the equation of the line. If you have omega one, omega two, and x one, we can generate x two. How can I get x one? I just generated x one here. It's all values from here to here with this small step. Now I need to generate x two values to get x two values. I will just, I will get it from this equation. I will move omega x1, omega 1, x1 to the other side. I will move b to the other side. So omega 2, x2 will equal minus omega 1, x1 minus b. Divide both sides by omega 2. So in this case, x2 will be minus omega 1 divided by omega 2 multiplied by x1 minus b divided by omega 2. So once you have x1 values, you can get x2 values using this equation. So it's omega 1 minus omega one divided by omega two multiplied by those x values minus bias divided by omega two. So if those two lines, it will generate all values of x one and the x two, which can blot this decision boundary. And after that, just blot it, scatter plot. So you will get this decision boundary. And when we have this line, we can see that all points are correctly classified. So in fact, the accuracy here, it's 100% accuracy. Correct? But again, uh, as Ali mentioned here today, uh, uh, we, we didn't use any validation set. So the model looks beautiful, looks nice, the accuracy is 100%, but this is not sure. I don't know if this model overfit or does not overfit because we didn't test it. We don't have any test sets. We used the whole data for training it. So we should expect that the performance will be beautiful like this, but this is not correct. I just want to say to you, this is not correct because we didn't test it. It's like you have a student, for example, master student studying. You just give him five pages. Please study those five pages. You will get A in the exam. He studied them very, very well. And he show you that he memorized those five pages, right? But I didn't test him. So this is not fair, in fact. So we need to test the model because the whole data set here in my model, we used it for training, but this is not correct. No, we need to divide it one for training, one for testing, and as a part for training, we need to take one part here for validation, right? This is very important to discover if your model overfits the data. We need to have a part here. We need to book a part for validation. So we can have the graph here. Not only this one, training error, but we need to have also validation error. 
we need to have the validation here. Yes, so um, you have this link. I put, I mean, this perceptron file, it's in, in GitHub. Please go to this uh, link and just open the file and try to change it. For example, try to divide the data into one for training and one for validation, one for testing. And they try to block this extra graph here for validation error with this one. So try to make some changes in this. This model, it's, uh, I, I'm sure that some of us sometimes will have simple data. I mean, it's not very important to go for deep learning because it's just, uh, because people just over overuse those deep learning stuff. So maybe it's not very important to use those complex models if we can solve it using simple one. So we need to start by using those simple models. As I told you last time, when we develop the pipeline of machine learning, we need to start with baseline model. Maybe the baseline is a perception, why not? Right? Don't don't imagine that when it's deep learning and it's LSTM and recurrent neural networks, you will accept it, no. Maybe it's a smart to go with simple ones because those simple, simple models, they, 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 they have better resistance against overfitting. It's easy to understand. You know, people are talking about explainable AI. This is explainable. When it's a perceptron, it's a simple, and it's easy for us to understand what has been done, why this patient is diagnosed uh, this and that for, because the same model is simple. So it's like explainable AI. It's easy to understand what has been done. So it's not a problem to start with a simple model. And after that, if, the, if, if, if the performance is not satisfying, we can go for more complex ones, but we need to try those ones first. So please, we will take maybe a break, maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I mean, bring your coffee and maybe eat something and try to go to the code and try to change it. So try to uh, uh, try to try to divide your data set into training, testing, and validation. And in this curve, we need to add the validation error here in this curve using the whole the same data set binary classification. Maybe some of you can try to use different activation function, for example, right? So uh, and we will meet after 15 minutes. Uh, so after 15 minutes, maybe someone, if he if he can get this graph for validation. He can just share his screen with us and show us how he did it. Yes. So thank you very much. And we will stop here and we will start maybe at uh, now it's 10, uh, in 10, for example, 25. Or should we have shorter break? We can start at 10, 25, but uh, I mean, you will use those time for working in the example. You need to run the example and also um, you can run the example, you can make some modifications. Um,